Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Brady Grove bringing you a very special interlude episode of Roto Bowler's official MMA podcast. Tap that. Folks, with me today, helping to facilitate this interlude episode, frequent guest co-host on Tap That. Give it up for Connor Bones. One Connor, thanks for being here. Thanks, Brady, for having me again. And with us today... This is an incredibly exciting episode. Guys, the ultimate fighter is going on. If you are familiar with UFC history, the history of MMA, the history of combat sports at all, you know who this man is. Give it up for Shoney, Mr. International Carter. Shoney, thank you so much for being here, man. This is exciting. Hey, it's my privilege, my pleasure, my honor to be here to take this interview off the rails. And <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Shani, that tonight is when the new episode of The Ultimate Fighter is going to air. It's a season where veterans are facing up against prospects. And that was an idea that was started when, you know, when you were on The Ultimate Fighter, bringing veterans back on to the show uh, and giving yep. them another chance to make it back to the UFC. Yep. So, you know, what... I mean, there's so many things that we could get into from season four of The Ultimate Fighter, obviously. But, yeah. you know, what do you think the mindset is of the veterans going into that house as opposed to the prospects? Because, you know, it's always talked about, you know, what the disadvantages that the prospects are at mentally. But what do you think are the challenges for the veterans? Trying to keep stride with a younger generation athlete. Once a, a young fighter gets past the spectacle and the awe of, Oh my God, Kaiser Soze is standing in front of me. You know, it's either a flight or fight response. So, from that perspective, I would think that if the fighter, the older guys, the, the elder statesman gets in shape, yes, they should be afraid because if you ever see a old school veteran with a flat stomach and six pack and packs, you go, oh shit, he or she is in shape. And that's literally what I laughed about when I, t- I used to tell promoters. I says, you can book me on a fight. You give me a necessary date and a reason to go to the gym twice a day, seven days a week, drinking five protein shakes a day, wearing a heart <laughs> monitor. You just might be in trouble because I'm going to throw techniques you've never seen. And I know how to, an older veteran such as myself I have a higher sense of governance of performance, which means I know how to cruise through 10 to 12 five-minute rounds twice a day. I know how to cut weight, lose weight without a sauna. You don't. Your coach don't because they're new to the business. When you see a, a rascally old man with salt in his goatee and a ball spot and he can go at least seven five minute rounds when the average. Oh, do we, do we lose you, Sean? Are you still there? Oh, these. You got to forgive me. These, these commercials. That, that I'm back. Just... No, no, what happens? I get. Just... You know what happens? I have these. I updated my phone. And these commercials pop up all the time. I think it's a virus. So I, I fig- I'm trying to figure out how to, you know, stop it. But back to what we were talking about, like, when y'all see that guy and all of a sudden you have a 51-year-old man out of shape can do seven or eight five-minute rounds with you and you're in your 20s, you sort of get like, what the hell am I doing wrong? Well, my body knows how to fight. You're still learning. And so, have you been keeping up? Like, you know, how will you keep up with MMA today and with the ultimate fighter that's going on right now? I will not lie to you. I haven't as de- been diligent because it's getting exponentially difficult for me to really, like, okay, because I'm either teaching boxing or kickboxing or judo. I'm like an ambassador around Chicago. I have keys to different schools of different styles. So, for instance, I'm being sent to Japan 
to test for a third or fourth degree in karate, which I've been doing. I've been a black belt for over 20 years. And I was a little bit busy. If you can't tell, I've missed a bunch of promotion tests. So basically, the headmaster of Shidokan Karate, which is an offshoot of Kyokushin and Shotokan, basically asked for my presence in Japan. And I will not be in Tokyo. I'll be up in the mountains of Japan. Like, you know, the big giant bell like Mulan, and you can look down on birds. That's what I'm going to be. Then I'll go to Foundation Jiu Jitsu, and I'm a student. So I took a sim, I, I was trying to learn a seminar with Robert Drysdale, and he was doing the butterfly guard, and I've never used it before. Then I'll go teach judo on Friday at the karate school, kickboxing Saturday at the karate school. And I'll go to boxing at a legendary old school boxing gym called Sam Colonna Boxing. And then I may go to the wrestling mat at Triton Community College. Then I'll do pancration, which is Greek gladiatorial combat somewhere that predates jujitsu. And I'm like, oh, then I'm trying to get in touch with David Feldman again with the celebrity boxing since they're now picking on MMA fighters mm-hmm. in boxing, which they know not to come to MMA because guys like me don't shoot double legs. I throw people. So I'm all over the place. And like I said, interviews of me go off the rails. I never know what the – I wake up one morning to anything, and then I have the very stereotypical baby mama drama with my youngest five-year-old, my daughter. You know, like when you know, the mother don't want to let the father be dad. And I have to put that aside while working on a talk show on MMA, a documentary on my life and career to be pitched to Apple TV and Netflix. And then I'm doing, oh my God, uh, I, I, I lose count the track of my every day. So I have a, oh, and y'all know I paint pictures, right? Y'all know I'm an artist? Of course we do. Yep. So I'm all over the place. See, look, that's some of my art. I did the, this off the rails moment. That's the picture of when Juliana Pena and Amanda Nunez weighed in. And that's awesome. Girl, and that's me, a man on the run. She's calling her shots. That's me in the background looking at her butt. <laughs> and that's me. That, that's the Pyramid of Giza, Kefren, and Cheops. Then I, I embellished on the double knockout when I referee. I was, that was one thing that I saw right before we hopped on here. I saw that you were the ref in that fight. You know, I've seen that video a million times. I never yeah. knew it was you. But um, can you talk about that a little bit? Just tell us what was going through your mind at that point, because I'm sure that was just an insane moment. That was so insane because, wait a minute, it's hat heavy. Y'all know it's me, Danny. (laughs) Okay. So I originally didn't even want to be there. And the promoter's name was was Jacob Staler, Staler, S-T-A-H-L-E-R. He's now a political activist now in California. Hilarious. He went from being an MMA promoter. So now I moved to California. He weight lifts and power lifts and talks shit about the politicians and government, which I'm not going to get involved with. So I didn't even want to be there. So essentially, out of spite, get ready to laugh. That alf- that outfit I was wearing with the Ed Hardy jeans and the, the affliction shirt with the pointy white shoes that we all wore back in that time with the giant belt buckles. Looking like, you know, the, the club douchebag. <laughs> yeah. I actually threw it on on purpose. I used to get clothes from Ed Hardy and Tom Matencio from Affliction. I'm still cool with him. He has a he has a different clothing line now because he uh, he's no longer affiliated with Affliction. So I put it on, and I didn't think, I thought maybe no one would like want me to be there. So I was sitting around watching the other idiot referee. He was messing up. I was scared for the athletes because I care. Mm -hmm. Even though I was an active athlete still, I still care about the next generation. 
So I was like, yeah, the cage in between the next fight because he was making some, I mean, fanboy mistakes. If you want to be a fanboy, be a fanboy. Know your role, okay? That's cool. I ain't against you. Do what you do. If you want to be a journalist, you want to be an empowered groupie, you want to be the athlete, you want to be the, the promoter, you want to be the, the, the gate door opener, you want to be the judge, whatever. I love it all. But if you're going to be in charge of somebody's well-being and they're trying to enhance their career, be on point, like a box of needles, like a field of cacti. He wasn't. So I told the promoter, get him out the cage or I'm going to do it for you. And nobody wants me to do that. <laughs> so he got out the he got out the cage. I, I made it quite clear he sucked. And I literally, you suck. Let's go sit in a chair. Who the hell you think you are? I'm glad you need to know. <laughs> Use Google. So <laughs> I walked up in the cage to referee. Lo and behold, one or two fights go through. I'm doing what Shoney does. I'm 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 Mr. Ben Ned done that. This these two jabronis, uh Sean and Sean Tyler and I forget the other Scott, so forget the name. Whatever, inconsequential. This shit happens. It's called the eight second saloon. An eight second double knockout occurs. I damn near shit my Ed Hardy jeans because who knows what to say? I almost peed and shit, pooped and farted all at once, sharted almost my pants. And it was, and I'm like, what? That's why I threw my hands like, what the flying five bucks is this? Literally, I beckon the doctor. They come running in. I wave it off. This is no contest. I know you're about to ask who won. Yeah, that was, that was my next question. I know. I'm, 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 Lugo Dumas. I'm already ahead of you. No, nobody won. Makes sense. Amateur fight. Speed forward. Because I didn't get paid for that shit. Maybe 50 bucks. I was pissed as Jacob. Because I'm like, bro, I was driving a, a V8 Caprice Classic with 22 inch rims. From Chicago to Indiana. You know how much that gas was? At that time, it was only like a dollar seventy-five. Long gone of those beautiful days. So, speed forward. Next thing you know, I get a phone call one morning from J.C. Penny. I'm and I have not had my number on the market yet. How in the hell y'all get my number? Who the hell is this? Calling me at 546 in the morning, crack a darning. No, I'm yawning. I wipe the cold out of my eyes. See who's this calling me and why. It was JC Penny. They wanted to do some business at my shop. They put me in Sean Tyler, whatever the hell the name was, in a JC Penny commercial. What did I just say about that fight? Amateur. Amateur. No payment. Wow. Referees or the fighters. So they were looking to get my permission to use the footage for a JC Penny commercial. So I'm like, okay, said, so do you have a manager? Is that someone we can speak to about you know negoti price negotiations for your image? I'm like, all right, yeah, uh, yeah, right. On it. Give me your number, lady. Jane Haber. It's crazy I can remember this. You can tell my my cognitive is still still working. The hell with another MRI CAT scan. I'm good. So, <laughs> ironically, I, mind you, the more you talk to me, you're gonna find in this story bits. I have a really strange resume. Most fighters can talk about their fight career. I can talk. About, I can keep a whole hour on anything but fighting. So. I didn't have a, a, a comprehensible, understandable reasoning of this type of contractual contractual negotiation. So I go to my my karate school. Ironically, the Chicago Fitness Center, the dojo, is a very eclectic background piece of Chicago history and fitness. I go, I go, I literally took off with a seven day bus card. Even though I was on U in UFC, I wasn't getting paid that much. None of them too. So I grabbed my seven day bus card. I skedaddled my ass all the way to Chicago Fitness Center. Now you have no frame of reference as to how far I was 
is where I live to where I'm now to Chicago Fitness Center. Let's just say it's a hike. But on that day, the Lord was shining on me and traffic green lights were everywhere. So I run, jump on the damn bus, scoot down the I will give you a full synopsis, but let's just say two buses and I'm there. I get into the gym. I run into one of none other than Marie P. Anderson. You are not supposed to know who she is, but you do know who Cindy Crawford is. Now, Cindy Crawford is a supermodel. Marie Anderson is the woman who discovered Cindy Crawford. Marie Anderson is also a black belt in karate. Not a fighting black belt. The Kata's and the you know people that don't fight, but they got a black belt. So she's a, a model agent. Like model models. Like not just Cindy Crawford. Like all of them. You can look her up on my friends list later. Give her a follow and a like and tell her I sent you. So literally I said, Marie, Madam Marie, I need your help. And I give her the whole blah, 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 speeding this interview up. She's like, oh, don't worry, I got you. Like, it's drinking tea. I'm like, oh, yeah, I know who that is, Jane Haber. I know about J.C. Penny. I get many many models for them. I'm like, oh, sweet. Do I need to give you her number? She's like, no, I got her. I got her on speed dial. Oh, excuse the hell out of me. Now, this is the average woman you would walk past and you would not know she's that matriarch of models. She calls, they talk. I walk out the gym, I go back home because I ain't got shit to say. I don't know what to say. She calls me the next day. Shoni, you're going to be excited. I'm like, I'm already excited you calling. How you doing today? How's the sun shining and you're part of life? What's going on? Is the water colder? Are the ice cubes colder? Tell me what's up. Are the potato chips more crunchy? I'm telling you, I say that stuff to people and you, and they were one. He has got to be punchy. You no, know, I've been like this ever since I was in the Marines. After I threw a hand grenade, different story. Back to the chips and and whips and and models. So she said, "I got you triple scale. Sounds good." I'm thinking, "What the fuck is triple scale? That means you know <laughs> not a home run, but you're on third and you're rounding to home plate. That's all I know about triple." And I don't play baseball at all. I'm not trying to swing three times to get home safe with nine men in type trying to keep me from going home. Anyway, literally from a free, damn near a free referee because gas at 50 bucks does not cover a V8 Chevy Caprice. She told me for eight seconds of work, I made $7,500. I said, What? <laughs> What? Eight seconds of work, $7,500? She said, yeah. I'm like, okay. Not mad at that at all. She said, you're not even a model, and you're getting paid more than some of my models that are in the mid midpoint of their career. I said, Marie, say less. She said, well, you know I'm going to have to take a cut. I said, Marie, say less. How much are we talking? I don't think she's going to say half. I would have still been happy. She took only $1,200. Wow. So I go to Ford Modeling downtown Chicago via bus, a few buses and two trains. Walk up, I walk into the building. I go past security. They knew I was coming. And not to mention how many black men you see walking around in combat boots, a top hat, and a kilt. Right? I'm the I'm that guy. So, literally, I walk into this modeling agency. All do, there's a building downtown currently where all the hottest women in the industry go to model, and they all they, they like they flock together like a giant room full of pigeons and crows. It was crazy. I couldn't believe it. I said, "There ain't nobody ugly up on this floor. Nobody." Even the big girls were gorgeous. I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck? How you pull that off? And I was like, is this a convention? What? So, oh no, this is just about every day. This is when we do our photo shoots and we disseminate content. I'm like, uh, raw, 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 understandable. 
I walk up. Tyler Bright and Sean Parker. That was the name. The two jabronis. Mm -hmm. So I get my $6,300 check. I sign off. She says, Shoney, I want you to meet somebody. I'm like, all right. All right, cool. She says some woman. I'm like, all right, all right. That's nice. That's nice. And Murray's like, you ought to give her a hug. I'm like, this could end up in an ex-girlfriend relationship. And I said it. <laughs> the girl's like, what? I said, oh, I'll make you my girlfriend. Don't think I want him to tough some of bitch up in here. I said, because you'll put up with me for a hot three months. And then you'll be an ex-girlfriend. <laughs> it's all before <laughs> some At least before me. So I gave the girl a hug and it was like, the, the longest hug ever. And so, except for that now I have a girlfriend named Laura. I hug her all the time. I even put her in headlocks when we sleep. <laughs> I actually, I put her in, I put her in a, a leg lock when we lay in the bed. And she, she they wasn't used to it at first, but now she's used to it. <laughs> now she knows the submission defense for it. Here's teaching. Right. Her. She's good with it. She's good. <laughs> <laughs> and so, oh my God. And so, I got this thing. The only sad, crazy thing is that either Tyler Bryant or Sean Parker came up with a knife. And basically took the check. And I'm like, how did y'all let some dude walk into a building with a knife? I went through a metal detector. I said, say less. I'm good. We good. I have not. I said, yeah, I don't know how he got out of Chicago because they were both from Indiana. But needless to say, nobody got cut. Nobody got stabbed. Nobody got scarred, especially the ladies. And, you know, the guys in there, they were too pretty to fight. Male models are not your top flight security or self-defense for a woman. And these women that want a pretty boy, they better ask him if he has a black belt in karate and jujitsu or wrestle or box. Because a pretty boy is no good in a self defense scenario. <laughs> so I laugh. So that is the briefest synopsis of the. <laughs> that was an amazing story, <laughs> man. That was an amazing story. I would definitely was not expecting a backstory like that for eight yeah. seconds of footage. That's awesome. Right. That happened. That's the brief version. <laughs> well, it actually it brings us to an interesting point because yeah. you know, talking about you know the the money you made from that commercial as opposed to the money you're making in the UFC and some other things and uh, it's interesting too because you are you are a personality that was would have been tailor made for this era the era of MMA fighters you know oh my God. yeah fighting boxers the the self promotion. Um, you know, you were a, a character kind of ahead of his time when you were on The Ultimate Fighter. My family even said that. And they're not even fight fans. And other people have said that. I said, I said these kids, some of, well, we know, we know that one kid who keeps getting in trouble, stole my, my whole thing. And it was nuts that the fighters back then, the fighters now, don't know how to present themselves in front of a camera. I'm mm -hmm. like, you are selling the premise of, oh, look at me. You have the powerhouse, the, the, the conglomerate, and now you're with Disney. My God, I'm operating with no manager, no career guidance counselor, only knucklehead training partners. <laughs> I'm the guy on this show talking to y'all about, oh, we follow me. Mm -hmm. after the show I mean I was wearing suits Speedo smacking the gringos on the ass and they loved it <laughs> articulate in front of the camera you know I did you seen them pictures on my my profile oh yeah and I did I, I sort of did okay yep <laughs> yeah you did <laughs> and from that background 10 are missing because some were stolen and lost and I got and I'm, it's a bitch trying to replace a belt yeah I can that imagine. cage belt in the background is sweet, man. That is, oh, yeah. that is too. OG. Literally, I'm, I've been shooting reels. Let me pull these off. I'm tired of being a superstar. <laughs> I like being me. So I'm learning how to shoot reels to go, oh, yeah, everybody, the increase the algorithm output. 
So I'm, I've been shooting. I'm still not done because I got close to 200 drawings and paintings in my apartment. Now, going back to payments and money and stuff. Mm -hmm. Let me stand up. Oh, my God. Let me see. Can I do that? Can I do that? Get a, a smaller but com more complete view. In these years of doing this versus my art, my traditional art versus my mixed martial arts, I can literally point out and tell you what each belt cost as far as what I get paid. And my first UFC, they didn't see it because they were all into Ken Shamrock and Tito Ortiz and Frank Shamrock. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, the next specter was Kimbo Slice. Now, I'm not knocking Frank. I'm not knocking Ken. I'm not knocking Kimbo. God rest his soul. Conor McGregor. He won two title belts. I don't know. I can't remember if he defended them ever. No, but, he never did. Yeah. Whereas Hall of Fame inductions. I'm alongside with Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee, Michael Jai White, Wesley Snipes, Dan Severson, there was some Roth Rock, Kathy Long. I need to keep going because that resume is long. That is a good resume. Right. I'm in that same damn group, right? And when I go to these Hall of Fame induction expos, I missed one, ironically, this last weekend for my karate and kung fu induction. Oops, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> I get, I get, I'm a little bit busy. I said I was coming. Sorry, Trevor Tassitano. Shit goes south in my life. So each belt, like, okay, before my belt, I literally was winning regional and state title belts and kickboxing as a wrestler. So my first UFC was UFC 22. I would have been in UFC 13, but my instructor didn't want me to go into it because he didn't think I was ready because I would have been fight, fighting an army rank. What is? <laughs> I'm like, I, I respect all my military branches, but I'm one of the cool kids, USMC. You suckers miss Christmas, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> I got a bunch of them. So. Yeah, you know, no, that, that's, that collection behind you is very impressive. Um, Something right. that comes to my mind that I have a, a question for you about. Um, yeah. When you were a, a mixed martial arts fighter, you know, now they don't have the ability to have in cage sponsors like on their shoulders. That's crazy. Like, yeah. They get that, one like, paycheck. Yeah, they get one paycheck, but they still got bills coming from different directions. Mm -hmm. And the money share is, well, <laughs> now I will not sit there and bash them too bad. My first UFC, when I already had belts, I had like my first UFC, I had over 40 or 50 fights before I got in. Mm -hmm. Or maybe more. I can't, it's hard. I'm putting them on, I'm getting them flipped to the flash drive from VHS tape. My, I was in UFC 22 before Dana White was the president. Mm -hmm. It was still Bob Merowitz and SEMA 4 Entertainment Group with Horry and Gracie. I made $500 to show, $500 to win. I won a thousand dollars. I then fought Adrian Serrano in UFC 28, I believe. I made two thousand dollars. One thousand to show, one thousand to win. Then the infamous we all know about UFC 31 with Matthew Serra. Eight thousand dollars. 4000 to show, 4000 to win. He made more money losing than I did win. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember, he came off of Abu Dhabi, and he was a Hensel Gracie black belt. Nobody expected me to win. They thought I was going to be some schlep up in, in, in the cage with Mr. Jiu-Jitsu world champion. My resume was so overlooked because even back then I was considered a journeyman. Literally, people, I didn't have the social media platform. I was a collegiate All-American wrestler, fourth in the nation in junior college. I was on two world teams representing the United States in international rules wrestling. I'd already won a, a, two U.S. titles in bare-knuckle karate and Muay Thai kickboxing. 
I was already a Golden Glove boxer. I was already doing judo. I came out of college as a first degree black, uh, first degree brown belt in judo. And I mean, it's more and more I can blah, blah, blah. So I had already a pedigree because even my instructor, he stole my spot for Abu Dhabi that one of the years. And he said, I wasn't ready for it. He went to Abu Dhabi in my place. His name was, his name is Master Robert Sherman. He, he, he headlocked Leo Vieira. And Leo Vieira from the headlock got his back and choked him out. And he said, when we came back, he said he, they cheated. How are you cheating jujitsu? <laughs> well, I later, years later, I saw the footage. I'm like, no, he threw him, but you got choked out. That's, that's Leo Vieira. But n- nevertheless, I never got another invite to ADCC. And it was crazy because there were the powers that be that even when I fought, knocked out Matt Sarah with nine seconds left, years ago, some guy sent me the, the old the, the old scoring cards. I still won. And I wish I could find that post. Then two weeks later, Joel Silva called me and had me fight Pat Militic. Short notice, because Pat lost the same night to Carlos Newton. And I knocked out Matt Serra. And I'm like, I was still not even, you know, after that type of fight, I was not granted time to recover mm-hmm. and get ready for a buildup against Pat Militic. A legend in his own right. Who, right. He was I'm, coming off that headlock choke that Carlos Newton got yeah. with massive bicep. Right. Mm-hmm. And then even before that, y'all may or may not have known I before I got a chance to fight in the UFC, I was fighting over in season Pancrase. And literally, the reason why I got invited to Pancrase is because the my former shit show manager, Phyllis Lee, the the what the mother of the X Pac, the one, two, three kids in the WWE, she lowballed my negotiated price to get me to fight in Pancrase. Well, I went to fight in Pancrase because I had just did 20 minutes against Pat Militic in a boxing ring in a baseball field in Iowa, in Davenport, Iowa. And I'm the only man in MMA history in Pat Militic's career to ever have thrown him. And that is out of the mouth of Pat Militic. I scored the only takedown. He scored one head kick. I scored every takedown, out punched him, punch for punch, kick for kick. And he got a unanimous decision in his hometown. Literally, let's keep going. Even when I fought Anthony Macias, you may or may not know who he is. He was the guy who was infamously belly-to-back suplexed by Dan Severn in the antiquated days of UFC. I'm the guy who out-punched. I threw Anthony Macias all over that cage, and they would not give me the footage to the fight so I could do a replay and do a and show people how bad I got ripped off. And those- Let's go. It was crazy. I got a bunch of this. I mm-hmm. even pulled off a Jesse Owens in between losing the pet to when they called me short notice to fight Nate Quarry like a week before the fight. That's why I was deconditioned because I was on break. Mm-hmm. Literally, I fought a German uh, uh, head of karate over in Mossingen, Germany. They changed the weight division when I got there, they said no spinning back fists were allowed and no belly to back suplexes. I still beat him. The grandmaster, who the head of like a, a Yakuza boss, was in the audience. Look at what I just said. A Japanese yeah. head instructor is in, is in Germany to watch a black American fighter, barely a black belt, fight one of his branch chiefs of his organization in Germany a Japanese boss in Germany to watch an American U.S. Marine fight a German blonde-haired, blue-eyed branch chief of Japan. I won the world title. They'd I think you muted yourself. There I you go. In Germany, to, to do the fight, win the world title, still, 
he came up to me and asked me in Japanese, his Romanian wife, the Japanese guy, Kancho Yoshiji Soweno, speaks Japanese. His Romanian translator wife asked me, what Con told me what Kancho said. I said, us. So I beat him playing, playing around. They never released the footage. They only gave me three thousand dollars, and that's, that's crazy. That, yeah, that's crazy. And I mean, to me, the no spinning back fist rule. That seems personal. That's what you're. That's what it I'm, was. Yeah. No spinning back fists and no belly to back or belly to belly suplexes. I. You want to hear something else even worse than that? Mm -hmm. Crazy. I got a one hour short notice call. I literally was called to fight a last minute fight that day. I'm in the dojo. At this time, I'm a young Shoney. I didn't know who Manson Gibson is. Manson Gibson is known as the Muay Thai killer, the master blaster, the black Bruce Lee, 11 time world champion. They had me fight him in Chicago at St. Andrew's Gym on short notice because his opponent did a no-show. I grabbed my bag, my truck grabbed his bag. We scram over there. I barely have time to get dressed and ready, walk out on the main event, and I beat his ass in the Bangkok Brawl rules. Like all strikes, they go groin strikes, head butts, you name it, elbows, you name it. And I've got that on VHS and flash drive. You want to hear the, the, the atrocity of my payday? Of course. $1,000. Man, that's rough. <laughs> I mean, especially one hour notice? That's one hour notice, $1,000, full house. He made only $250. Oh, wow. That's the least. And literally, by today's standards, you know, that's a multi million dollar fight. Two world champions, or, or the young number one guy in Chicago. Fights the eleven time world champion. The and now with this talk show mm -hmm. that's coming up in the documentary, I'm spilling the beans on everybody. I love that. Absolutely love that. Tell yeah, us I'm still, more about I'm your... going to do interviews. I'm going to still come on your show again. I'm still going to talk to is the 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 Federation of Israeli Martial Arts again. FEMA, F I M A. Mm -hmm. I said that right. Federation Israeli. Anyway, you get it. Theme. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah. Tell us a little bit about your, your documentary. Um, when's that coming out? Or have you, I heard you say you pitched it. Tell us more about that. Oh, my God. Okay, that threw me. I ain't going to tell you the backstory. I ain't got enough battery life. <laughs> it was just a, a oops. Oh, yeah, by the way, I'm so-and-so. I ended up working security for a bowling alley because of a friend who gets me security jobs sometimes. I'm going to keep it that brief. <laughs> so I'm talking <laughs> to the boss. And so he wants me to do this interview with his son. His son is an is a award winning independent film director. So I talked to Quincy or Quentin, Quincy. They're both the type of dads that do that. My name is Quentin. My son's name is Quincy. Or he's, <laughs> anyway, whatever. Q and Q. So I'm like, all right, cool. I really was like, like I'm talking to you. I don't mind. So We've been talking about an initial discussion. He's telling me how he's got stuff on YouTube and he and he's friends with the pastor of his church. I think it's all commendable. And the pastor of his church is over 35 years, best friends, Barack Obama. I'm like, okay, that's amazing. Cool. Mm -hmm. Why are you telling me about former President Barack Obama? Because former President Barack Obama has his hands in Netflix. I'm like, what? What? Are you kidding me? Okay, okay, now you got me listening. We're going to pitch this to the pastor. The pastor's going to tell Barack Obama about you. I said, he's the president. He knows, he's the ex-president. He knows who I am. They all know who you are. So, okay, so we've been doing all of this content gathering, which I laughed about because they were like, who do you know? I said, you mean who I don't know? <laughs> I said, I'm I'm within five calls of Royce Gracie. And he was like, what? I said, even he knew who Royce Gracie was. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm pretty cool with Henzo and 
everything. You know, I sort of got a history in the business. So right now it's been funding issues, just trying to get money because I didn't know how much it cost to put some shit together. So literally, I have such a crazy ass story background. He says, who do you know? I says, I'll call all these different head rush, all the MMA companies. I'm trying to get them on board. No one's calling me back. I'm tripping. Then I thought about it one day. I stole a trip to Russia. No joke. This this may lead up. Keep me on keep me on track because okay. the whole Russia thing will take us in a different direction. So I stole a trip to Russia. I meet up with a guy, and I later find out he's a movie director. And we can go back to Russia. Don't worry. I got 28% of my phone back. So <laughs> literally, he's a movie director. He was in Russia. Somebody he's, he's now in America. And so I put them together with KJ. KJ knows this guy named Don Cress. Don Cress is heavy in the, in the in the industry of entertainment. He used to be like a road manager or something with um, old school Mickey Rooney, like older than everybody, Mickey mm-hmm. Rooney. I said, oh, your $100 bills in your bank account got small faces. The other guy's his son and everybody's in the room was like, what? I said, big faces are new kids with money. Small face 100 people got old money. They were like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, right, 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 right. Okay, I'm glad y'all knew that. So I put Q with them, and now they're working on that. I have been running into more people about now they want to do documentaries on underground fights. There's another guy named Larry Biella and Dre Boy. They do action movies and stuff. So, and you can look all these people up. So Larry Biella, B-I-E-L-A, he wants to do a documentary on underground fights and me and my interaction with underground fights. I said, yeah, I got content. I got, I know people that have done them. My buddy Joel Radwanski, who was on the TV show Chicago PD as Officer Winters, he's, he's working on the talk show of the beginnings of MMA before it was MMA. Mm-hmm. So... Some some of the patriarchs and matriarchs of martial arts in the country, I know. Like, you would not know who brought Bear Brand Gies to America. That's the first martial art gi and that was marketed to America. Mm-hmm. That was brought to America by Master Chung Sun Shin. He was best friends of the man who founded Kyokushin Karate, Masoyama. Now, I'm cool with Master Shin because when I was a kid, I was trying to learn judo from him. And mm-hmm. He's Korean Japanese. I go over to his shop and told him about what's going on. I want to interview him. Then there was these people who, on the south side, Master Shin's on the north side. But I call it, there's an organization. There's an organization. It's called the uh, Midwest Black. Black belts. Wait, I get it mixed. The black guy, black belts. They get a whole, you know, that thing. Mm-hmm. They were direct students of Robert Trias. Robert Trias. Oh, I'm getting this right. I'm saying the right name correctly. He was the guy who brought karate to America. Oh, wow. Right. So I'm talking to Preston Baker, and uh, I forgot. I call him Master Tano, and his Grandmaster Cynthia Williams. Um, oh God! I'm, oh, the Black Coalition of Martial Artists and the Black Belts in Chicago. Gotcha. Mostly. So, spinning off of that, I told them one day because they they know me. You know, like I, I I did know Howard Jackson long before he passed away. He was the direct martial arts instructor for Wesley Snipes. Hmm. So that's who I'm I'm trying to interview and all these type mm-hmm. of guys. My last Hall of Fame induction, I go there and they know who I am. I'm always cool with everybody. So my executive producer, Joel from CPD, keep up with me. <laughs> <laughs> we sitting there on my table with the belts. I'm trying to give autographs to the kids and sell art. Mm-hmm. I see a fat old black man being rolled up in a wheelchair. I'm like, who the hell is that? I said, he's got a red and white belt. I said, goddamn, 
He's on his last promotion. Holy shit. You don't see them very often. Mm-hmm. And he said, show me. That's Grandmaster Victor Moore. I'm like, okay, talk to me. I don't know all of y'all. There's a bunch of us. Benny the Jet Ortiz, Orlando Rivera, uh, Cynthia Williams, Cynthia Rothrock, Grandmaster Samuel Kwok. You know, like what the fun of the American founders of Kung Fu in America. We buddies. He's worth like $650 million. Oh, wow. He's like, great, right, right. That's one of my homies. Not like borrow me some money, homies, but homies. <laughs> I'm like, okay, talk to me. Who is it? And they're like, that man right there faced off against Chuck Norris and beat it. He beat Superfoot Wallace. What? He beat Superfoot Wallace? I'm like, get the hell out of here. And he said, Shoney, buckle up. I'm like, okay, I'm buckled up. I'm sitting down, put my Pepsi down. What's up? That's the man who faced off versus Bruce Lee. I said, whoa, 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 and whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold it, hold all the hell back. Mm-hmm. Lock the door. What you mean he faced off of Bruce Lee? You, you may have seen that footage when they, they do that reflex, like, like Bruce Lee tries to punch him and he but blocks he the headgear on and stuff. That's that's him. That's him. That's wow. Him. I've watched that a lot. Yeah, we all did. Yeah. So <laughs> I said, Joel, get the camera. We're going over there. Right now. Right now, right now. Joel and I go over there because I'm also an affiliate marketer for this Vibasage. Um, like not not a therapy gun. That thing is primitive. I got the new version of it. And I'm trying to look at well, I was gonna plug it right now. Well, literally, I I play I said, uh, Grandmaster Victor Moore, huge fan, fanboy. You don't know me, but I gotta let you know. I'm your fan. I'm one of your fans. So, literally, I said, I want to try something with you. I said, please, I will not try to rub you the wrong way. Because you actually can get somebody to massage and kill them the wrong way. Mm-hmm. That's where it comes from. Don't rub me the wrong way. That's actually, did you know that? That's one of them type of facts. Mm-hmm. So, I'm working with, <laughs> you see how my interviews go all off the rails? Hey, so, we love it, man. We love it. So, I'm working with Team Doctors USA, sp- International Sports Hall of Fame inducted chiropractor, Dr. James Stockson. And this is the Vibasage. It's a wider head mm-hmm. and it gives you a deeper massage and it's a variable intensity. So it, it sinks deeper into a wider space on the muscle. So I put this on Grandmaster Victor Moore. He fell in love with it. He was like, oh, it's making my skin itch. I'm like, it's because the blood is just going through the integumentary system. Mm-hmm. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, like, oh, uh, your skin. Is it, and then other people were like, what do you mean in integumentary system? And I'm like, guys, um, I'm just not here with, for cute looks and suits. I'm a personal trainer, human performance analyst specialist. And they were like, what? I'm a high-level trainer. And then I said, you have 13 operating systems and the homo sapien genome type X, Y chromosome carrying animal. And they were like, what? There are 13 systems in the human body. The largest organ on your body is your skin. And they were like, oh. I was like, yeah. So you fight and you know this stuff. I'm like, I can break down the, the characteristics of the voluntary skeletal, skeletal muscle fascia. And one of the OGs who's kind of smart, I forget, was it <laughs> Cynthia? It was one of them, the old, older than me group. And he or she, somebody was being sarcastic, like, oh, yeah, I like to hear you do it. I, said, I can also recite the glycolysis cycle. And, and essentially, they were like, oh, yeah, you over your head now. There's no way. I said, are you ready? I said, yeah. Buckle up, fellas. This is when I switch to nerd. Epimesium, paramesium, sarcolemma, mitochondria, 75% phospholipids, 22% cholesterol, 3% water, and capillaries. Now, that's what your mu- your voluntary muscle move, your muscle are made of. Mm-hmm. You have voluntary, involuntary, smooth, fast, and slow twitch muscles. Smooth muscles pump, pump the blood through the body to and from the heart. Slow twitch are strength, fast twitch are speed. Now, I ain't going to go too much further other than 
rec recitation of the glycolysis cycle, which is splitting of the sugar molecule, primary food source, thin store fat, which is maximized through the, through the glycolysis cycle, which is 65 to 75% of your perceived maximum heart rate and the battery of your RBC or the red blood cells known as the mitochondria. So it expedites the subcutaneous adipose tissue, not the visceral tissue that stays in between the organs, but the subcutaneous underneath the skin of the mm -hmm. otherwise known as the integumentary system. That concludes that portion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and doctors and everybody were like, you went to school for this? No, I just read a book or two dozen and recited it like 12 to 13 times a day when I was a personal training manager for LA Fitness. And I had to know that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, know how to apply that science to daily exercise to maximize people's ability to metabolize body fat and synthesize muscle with protein, branch chain amino acids, and L glutamine and L carnitine and L arginine as the primary basic uh, amino acids that you need because your BCAs or branch chain amino acids are leucine, isoleucine, and valine, which synthesize protein weight isolate. And your L-glutamine repairs the muscle fascia by reducing the lactic acid production through arduous weightlifting exercise. You can see how many times I've said this. Yeah, man, you got it right off the top of your head. That's impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why I laugh when people have always said, you sound like a lisp. I'm like, no. I said, if you've been punched and kicked, thrown and choked as many times as I, I have, you would too. But under considering what I have retained over 37 years, and, I'm okay. And but, Shelly, there's yeah. a little, kind of a long-winded question at you, but there's there's a lot yeah. to add here because, folks, if you don't know, Shoney Carter's career official professional kickboxing record is 57 and five. Mixed martial arts. 51, 32, 7, and 1. He is... It's more than that, actually, which is hilarious. The and, MMA... The kickboxing is right. The MMA record is ridiculously... It, whew. And they said that on the Eastern Fighter, too, is that there was, there was like, what they say, 198? Uh, yeah. And, and he is in the USA Martial Arts Hall of Fame uh, going back to 2008. Action Martial Arts Hall of Fame induction in 2010. He was a National Junior College All-American wrestler. He went to the Olympic trials. He was fighting professional mixed martial arts officially dating back to 1997. He fought Chris Lytle and Nate Marquardt and Pancras. And yeah. sure, you're very representative. If you try to tell the story of mixed martial arts, yes. you can't do it without you. And if you're telling the story of the UFC and the flavor of it in that early 2000s, you can't do it without you. And it all kind of, kind of boils down to that one iconic moment, you getting the first spinning back fist knockout in UFC history against Matt Sarah. People are going to remember that forever who are fans of this sport. It, what's kind of been the lasting impact in your life of, you know, your, your whole career, so much being involved, you've fought everybody, and that one moment is like a, a quintessential Shoney Carter, Mr. International Highlight. You know, it's funny, like, when I think about my entire career and what I've done, people I've met, the training, I also think about the struggles of it all. And the, the, the most impactful from a pers personal perspective behind the cameras was the financial struggles. The physical struggles, eh, they, that, that happened trying to deal with the professional side of struggles, like trying to have a manager, someone who actually cared about me. They were not trying to take advantage or pimp my career and, you know, custom to benefit only them. One of the more personal, professional situations I had, buckle up for this, Dana White himself flew to Chicago, private jet, private limo, to come see me. Drove up to 3131 North Lincoln, 
Avenue, Chicago Fitness Center. The, the U.S. headquarters for Shido Khan Karate. What teach it? I knew he was coming. I didn't know exactly when, but it was Dana White. So he showed up. I jumped in the limo. No, before we walked through the gym, and we saw the gym. A few questions about this is where I train. I'm like, yeah, for the most part. But I'm all over the city. I'm, I, I isolate. He take, then takes me to an interview. And amidst that ride, 30 minutes or so, however long it was, that was the strangest interaction, very direct, but yet vague time I've ever had with him. The only time I've ever really interacted with him. And he says, you know, I'm in control of, I'm in control of your career. He said, we can make of it what you want. It's just what you're willing to do. I said, rather than say I would fight anybody, I said, I'm listening and I'm trying to understand. And I told him, I said, you're worth hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm trying to get out of a one-bedroom apartment. I said, and I admitted to him, I said, I don't know where you're going with this. And I was like, tell me what you want. I said, tell me what you need. What do you want? And he looked, he, he lowered the windows, looking out the window as we were driving by through Chicago. And while he was looking at the window, he was staring into whatever the hell he was looking at. Could have been a big booty girl on the west side of Chicago. I don't know. And I'm like, you know these guys from Jackass want me to fight Tom, uh, Johnny Knoxville. He's like, no, no, no. You're, you're too dangerous for all that. I'm like, I'll take it easy on him. I'm trying to get a paycheck. Because that's all I saw was that immediate give me some money. I'm trying to get the hell out of the one-bedroom apartment. He's no way not going to let you fight him. Like, Damn. man. And I said, man, you tripping. Long silence. We get to the studio. I get interviewed by Lisa Prati. I still have the video on VHS. And essentially, nothing much after the interview was said to him, from him, by, you know, to me. And literally, I think about of all of the culmination of adventures, of the sort of things I've done, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of cute, right? You know, mm -hmm. no eBay, no eBay or Amazon, but it was amazing. I look at it and I tell the, the young fighters, the new ones, know how to present yourself to being in front of the camera. Because that's one of the biggest parts of what I was able to do to help bolster my career. I was not in jeans and a white shirt with a baseball hat and gym shoes. Hey, you know, you guys go out there and fight, you know. <laughs> I mean, you look at what Conor McGregor is doing. Aside from the dolly in the bus window, slapping an old man, strong arming a phone, being accused of sexual assault, you know, things like that. I was like the guy who, when I did uh, the Iron Ring, on BET, I'm the first MMA fighter to challenge Floyd Mayweather to a boxing match. That never happened. I was the first fighter on Judge Mathis. I think I'm probably still the only MMA fighter to ever be on Judge Mathis. When I when we won a, a talk show, Dr. Keith Ablo, I've been trying to get the footage from all the other times when I was on TV, when I was on Jerry Springer. God rest his soul, as a guest security for Jerry Springer. That's Isn't crazy. that crazy? Yeah, that's they crazy. didn't pay me for that. I didn't get paid for it. Got yourself out there, like you said. You know, yeah. you present yourself. Right. Sign autographs. Get you some trading. A fighter, especially the, the new the new amount of money they get, mm -hmm. way more than mine. And all the platforms. 
all the platforms right. that because dude, oh you, you, the example you gave was perfect because there's so many fighters that have that same exact outfit and that same voice that come out and they're like hey, you know uh, I, I like to fight uh, I was a right. wrestler in college and uh, you better be ready because I'm gonna knock you out and it's like man nobody is gonna know you from, you make yourself a lot more replaceable when that's your person and it's always those guys that have the complaints when somebody utilizes their personality to break the tie between them and someone who's an equal level of a quality fighter. Right. And I told I, I when I found out this, like I there's an energy drink with my image on the can. And I remember I went and had some made just for like a novelty to give out to people. Then I found out they were selling them. And then I find out there's an esport where people are making money off of playing video games against each other. They bet against them. Or bet, you know, you bet if you win, or in the other people can bet on the whole fight. Mm-hmm. A lot of fighters have long been in the UFC, and you, as the journalist, you as the student of journalism of MMA, you don't know them because they are so replaceable. Mm-hmm. How many women fighters have there been? How many male fighters have there been? I was in the first 100 class. And I laugh because now I'm trying to get, I'm going to go buy some trading cards, get some trading cards made of myself again, and literally autograph them and sell them. Or autograph pictures and sell them. And it's not just about making profit of money outside of the cage or ring, but it leaves an, an an emblazoned mark in a fan. When somebody shows a picture that they got autographed by their favorite fighter or, or a notable fighter, that puts a butt in the seat, which then in turn makes you more valuable to the promoter. And I learned that when you're exciting, when you can open your mouth and present yourself, And now some of the fighters are now teaching techniques online to develop a following. As a fighter who's been there, done that better and and more than most, the smallest rememberable hurdles is like trying to get Instagram to verify my account. I'm supposed to pay for it when I've already paid an enumerate amount of dues. When I was doing this before, it was cool. Mm-hmm. Why? Why can I get that check mark? Why can I get my Facebook account verified? I have to pay for a Twitter account verification. When people fake my profile and say that they're me, when you can tell when there's real footage versus a a, a right click and paste or screenshot, then post it on a a different account. I remember going to the Facebook building downtown Chicago trying to get them to eradicate the other accounts and verify mine so that people would know that it's really me. And these fighters who have the powers that be behind them verifying their accounts for them. And they still don't get the business of it. Daniel James, number four or five in the world in Bellator. Heavyweight. Mm-hmm. He threw out the first picture of a Chicago Cubs game. Guess who was directly responsible for getting him involved in MMA? Who was it? You? We were, we were trainers at an export in Logan Square in Chicago. I showed him how to throw a leg kick. I showed him how to punch. You know, he's 6'5", 275. He's big. He can throw a punch. Mm-hmm. But to put together combinations, I was the one who was teaching him judo at heavyweight. As an amateur, he went eight and two or nine and two as an amateur in one year, won three title belts. And literally, in the day's modern generation, people will question me like, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All you got to do is just send him a picture of your, your room behind I you. Have. Yeah. I have. I laugh. Even when I'm in the gym, they'll be like, well, I don't know. I says, I don't – other coaches, I, I cameo in different gyms. We're doing a double-leg drill. 
I don't do double legs. I'll wait till y'all get done with that. Well, you need to know this. Um, I did track and Bowman for the United States in the Olympic competition. I said, so you can't find footage of me shooting a double leg in MMA. If you, you find one, I'm going to be amazed. There may be one. I said, but I don't score two points. I'm trying to make a point. I'm trying to win. Mm -hmm. Not score two points. And literally, I think about where the business started to where it is now. And like you said, a long-winded answer as to what is one of the most impressionistic moments? I have too many. I have way too I wrestled a bear in Russia because they dared me when I was in St. Petersburg. That's I did it before Khabib <laughs> was damn near born. And they made remember everybody made a big deal about Khabib wrestling a bear as a child. Mm -hmm. I did it on I did it on a dare. When I stole a trip because a friend of mine, oh, you may have heard of him, Brian Gassaway. He lost to Diego Sanchez in his one and the only time in the UFC. He committed suicide. He was my training partner. Man. I stole a trip from him because he wouldn't take the fight. I, I tried to go to Russia for free. They made me fight. Then after I whooped this guy's ass, they raised the other guy's hand. They didn't want me to win because the next opponent would have been Andre Seminar when he was the Russian terror in the UFC. Because I was throwing this other poor bastard. I later found out he was a, a former Sambo world champion, which I didn't give a shit about because I had no understanding of what Sambo was. Mm -hmm. Bring your ass. And I wrecked this guy. I scored every takedown, ended the fight, started the fight on top of him, ended the fight punching him. He turned his head and I, as I was throwing a punch, and I punched him in the back of the head by accident. The referee took a point with no warning. And then as the buzzer went off, then they had a long ass time to, you know, when you can tell some bullshit. Mm -hmm. The car took forever to come to the cage. What the fuck? I'm, I'm, I'm not sweating anymore. Then they raised it, they couldn't raise his hand because I broke his ribs punching. Because I was, had already trained with Roy Jones Jr.'s former boxing coach. I'd already worked with Floyd Mayweather Sr. I messed around with Mike Tyson. So, yeah, I can throw a punch and I can box. So I broke the guy's rib. He couldn't even get his hand raised. They said, don't worry. Don't worry. We pay you as if you won. That's crazy, man. Right. Like I said, my documentary is going to be so over the top. Even the guy from that owns Channel 66, who's a multi-billionaire, Larry Biella and Dre Boyd, they do movies with Dan Seven and other guys. And when I was telling them the story, they were like, your documentary cannot be one episode. And they wanted an outline for the documentary. Or I said, well, I'm trying to get a book deal because I have a transcript for my autobiography. And they were like, wait, what? I know you probably thinking that too. I have a transcript for my journal on my life. This is the journal, gentlemen, that was on the Ultimate Fighter with me. That is awesome. How did I get it back from production? <laughs> she, walked, she walked out of her office and had a letter opener and a drawer that can be breached. <laughs> That's, yeah. that's an awesome looking notebook, man. Yeah. Oh, oh. Let me see something. Oh my god. Where are the other ones? I've got three of them. I literally have chaptered my life from the beginnings. And it's crazy because when people even the, the she's not new anymore, the girlfriend, she's she has been with me now just over a year and a half. She sees these Hall of Fame inductions. She saw me there when I was the outstanding wrestler in, in college. 
she she has seen the li uh -oh, the lifetime achievement award stuff. I got plaques sitting around the house of stuff <laughs> that that predates MMA and my my journaled life and doing interviews and like she's in the bedroom right now she's listening sometimes I talk her to death because she always she always says we have this this couple joke with me because I I'm kind of repetitive but that's because I'm an instructor she says bald eagle feather you shown bald eagle feather bald eagle feather what do you think that would mean not the American Eagle that the feather is. I have told this story so many times. I bet if I was to ask Laura to come out here and you'd hear the story, you'd laugh because you then I'd say go back in the room and she you she has my delivery now on that story. I was asked by Terry Triplecock of King of the Cage to referee a, a fight show. I said, all right, I'll be right there. Where you at? Where you at? Where's the plane at? You know. He says, no, no, it's in Wisconsin. All right. Or Michigan. One, one of them. One of them. That was Michigan. So, brrr, Terry kicks me like two, three hundred bucks for gas. Not to pay me. Gas. He paid me when I got there. Literally, I hold the rules meeting because I know I know the rules inside now. Even the commissioner guy that was sitting there, he's like, you got it. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just here just to collect the check. I'm like, all right, cool. Blah, 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 blah. The fight's gone, not a hitch. After fight party. Now, I don't know if they have after fight parties anymore. Because of this. I don't know. Well, I'm, at, I'm on an Indian reservation. I'm at one of the, the six nations. I forgot which one it is. Well, I'm at the at the bar and the old man behind the bar I later find out he's the chief I'm like alright alright they got the jukebox they got people sitting around there playing pretty good music they have the, you know that little jukebox you can touch and pick your music you can search mm -hmm. the uh -huh. net with it I'm like okay okay and so I said can I pick some music is okay chief we good he said yeah go ahead I go and I put on salsa music I love salsa dance. Other than painting pictures, I salsa. Other Hell than yeah. fighting, I salsa. Fighting is a side gig compared to my salsa. A lot of the same footwork involved, I'm sure. Same footwork, same thing. A lot more sexy. So, <laughs> literally, he's like, he freaks out. He clears space for me at his bar. I'm like, what's wrong? What's wrong? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, in a, in a, you know, cause a, a anything. Mm -hmm. He's like, you wait here. Okay. He runs and go gets his wife. I'm like, what's up? What's up? I didn't mean to, I don't mean nothing. Literally, his wife is a salsa fan. Native American woman is a salsa music lover. Mm -hmm. Salsa dance lover. Can't make this up. Native American tribe, I'm Shoney. He finds out my name is Shoney. Because, yeah, you see where this all goes? Yeah. Shoney, Shawnee. I'm on the dance floor dancing with a Native American chief's wife doing salsa on a reservation after I refereed an MMA show. That's awesome. I mean, you played the right music at the right time. Right time. Two, three, four songs go over. Then some others, Led Zeppelin, some other shit comes on. All right, back to, back to the bar. I didn't think nothing of it. He comes up to me. He gives me the Native American hug and shake, handshake. He goes back in the office again. I didn't think nothing of it. He comes out. I didn't have my top hat, by the way. Literally, he presents to me an American bald eagle feather. To this day, I have that American bald eagle feather. I promise the next time you ask me about interviewing, I will not tell you the story again. Hey, man, it's a good story. I like <laughs> right. it. 
So or I have a stuff shelf with a bunch of stuff like mm-hmm. from other countries that I've been to. Well, yeah. That is the ball, the American Bald Eagle story from. And then I found out that it's actually a felony to have them. Oh, wow. Because, I, because it's a national bird and you're not supposed to have them. So if some Secret Service knock on the door after we get off this interview, I'm going to deny it. And I'll hide some of it. They won't. They won't be able to find it. Maybe it's past the statute of limitations at this point. Um, yeah. Well, Shiny, I don't want your phone to die in mid sentence. So what I will yeah. say is, it has been an absolute pleasure speaking with Mister International today. Thank you so much for being here. And if there's anything else you want to say, anything that you want to shout out, go ahead. The floor is yours. Okay. Let's see. First of all, thank you for having. Me. Thank you for tell, uh, for sharing time with me. I'm a personal trainer. That's how I make my money. As you can see, I'm sort of okay. I'm sort of all right. Sort of know some things. Uh, I'm going to uh, Japan in September in front of the Yakuza to do a belt promotion test. As a secondary black belt in karate, I don't know what belt they're going to give me. I'm going to keep all my fingers because I know not to make any mistakes <laughs> like that. Uh, follow me on Instagram and Twitter uh, and Facebook. And ever since I've been doing a lot of reels, check out my art. Follow me. I'm doing reels on Instagram. And my art is for sale. I'm going to be shooting more reels. I got a whole bunch. I got a bunch of belts. I got a bunch of art. And essentially, I'm going to be doing reels. I'm going to give stories to my belts as well I'm going to be give, shooting stories about my art as well I don't know Uh-oh. real quick I know it's dark in there I got I just was light this how much more that I have to do reels on that's awesome that's a lot <laughs> a lot of damn art and I framed it all <laughs> it's hilarious because the girlfriend she, like I said, she's been immersed into what I'm about. Her name is Laura St. Clair. And super supportive, super supportive. The first one I've ever had was a teammate. And I'll tell you the next time we talk about her um, wedding engagement ring, you will not, you will not believe how that happened. <laughs> I only got seventeen percent, so just know it, it was the most you you would literally say that I'd be okay with it. Tony, you a motherfucking lie. That's why I'd say I understand you if you when I tell you that next time. I'm gonna keep you hanging on that. I got hey, we got a, we got a reason to talk again. I'm not upset with that. Yeah, I got I got to first got to go talk to her mom and dad to ask for permission to marry her because I'm very old school about that. Mm-hmm. What are your intentions with my daughter? Well, you ought to see them carrots on her finger. As I'm trying to grow a garden. But uh, <laughs> literally, like I said, the art that I'm doing, I'm going to be making it available for prints. I'm doing an art piece for Autism Speaks because I'm very closely affiliated with autistic children. My heart goes out to them. This is one of them. I'm not done with it yet. Come I'm going to do one. Hand. Yeah, I'm going to do one on domestic abuse because I hate to end the conversation interview like this, but her name was Taylor Guerra, Taylor the Terror Guerra, and she was on the internet news. Um, She was a world-class grappler as a child, and she was beaten to death by her baby daddy. And literally, the punk hit her from behind. She He bludgeoned her to death. She was on life support for a while, and her parents had to pull the plug. Well, to give you a little bit about Taylor, and I'm going to do an art piece, I promised him, was that in one year, 2018, right before COVID, like a year before COVID or two, in one year, now think about all of the baddest motherfuckers in MMA that you know of, all of them, right? Mm-hmm. Think of Damian Meyer. Think of uh, uh, Gordon Ryan. Think of all the Gracies and everybody gets submissions, right? Mm-hmm. The submission artists. 
Taylor Guerra in one year in competition uh, versus boys and women because she, when she was a little girl to being an adult woman, teenager, she in one year she scored 94 submissions. Right. She That's was crazy. way better coming up than Ronda Rousey, Cyborg Santos, Holly, no, 94? Shit. Yeah. I ain't scored 94 submissions in my entire cumulative career, competition, and practice. And so it's this very sad state of being. So I'm yeah. in honor of her. I used to call her little mama. And her dad asked me when I walked in, they didn't know I was coming. They had me speak in her memorial service. Oh, and I wow. took it to them. Yeah, yeah. They only saw me a handful of times. She would travel from coast to coast, up and down, north, south, east, west, competing. Little Mama had more title belts than I did. And I got close to 30. Mine are, you know, different disciplines and pro. Yeah. But for a, a woman, just I don't give a shit. 94 submissions in one year. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, man. Good for you for uh, raising some awareness on that. Definitely a big problem. And you know, I'm definitely looking forward to checking out all your artwork. Thank you so much. And I'll be working with the veterans soon, too, as a U.S. Marine Corps veteran. I just found out they want me. So I'm like, yay. And hopefully, like I said, all the news, all the news that I have that's going on, it's going to be a lot coming. And I want once again thank you for having me because there's a, there's so much to be said about what's going on between the talk show, the documentaries, ugh, the artwork. Yeah, man. Well, I'm excited for all of it. I can tell you what. Yeah, I, I'm I'm excited as well. There's so, so much the the past of your career, and there's there's so many possibilities now in the year 2023 for you to finally tell all of those amazing stories that were coming out. before you know before professional MMA was really even in the form that we know now. NHB, NH, no holds bar. <laughs> before Dana, after Dana, and don't be surprised if you see me on Celebrity Boxing or. Or some, and if I do an MMA fight, just know I'm I'm having fun. Gotcha. It's, That's good to hear. Yeah. And if they call me for Ultimate Fighter Veterans versus the Kids, I'll <laughs> laugh. At you win, like, you win that season easily, <laughs> dude. It would be would that not be hilarious? I'm granddad now. Keep your hands <laughs> up, kid. I won't. It's gonna hurt. It ain't gonna be a lot. I'm gonna hit you one time, and you ain't gonna want to fight no more. <laughs> All right, y'all. Let me go. I'm down to 15 percent. I gotta plug this phone in. Shoni, I know oh. Brady said thank you, but want to thank you as well. This has been amazing. Love hearing your stories, man. Hey, and there's more. That was the tip of the tip of the spear. We'll run it back. We'll have to run it back soon. And okay, we, sounds we good. We gotta have him back on the show. And folks, this has been another interlude episode of Roto Baller's official MMA podcast. And this was with Shoni, Mister International Carter. Thank you again for listening. Thank you, Shoni, for being here. Follow Shoney on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Follow me on uh, on Twitter. Y'all better follow him. <laughs> yeah, you better. Follow That's the marvelous. podcast on Tap That In The May podcast at Facebook and YouTube. Folks, thanks for listening. This has been an amazing and a blast of a ride. Have yourselves a great night and peace. <laughs>